Scott, it's always good to catch up with you. Um, how exposed are you to these high prices? How much money are you making right now with Brent at 65? <clears throat> yes, Alex, uh, we had a great quarter yes yesterday, and uh, we do have some um, hedges that uh, we're not getting the full benefit, but going into the second half of 2021 and going into 2022, we pretty much get almost full benefit. So we're excited about it. We announced our variable dividend policy yesterday. Uh, the most important part, part of that is the fact that we're going to give back 75% um, of our free cash flow, about $16 billion over the next years, back to the investor. Uh, in terms of hedging, because you just brought that up, so real quick, I want to touch on it. Um, do you think that we're going to stay in sustained backwardation where prices today are much more expensive than prices later? Um, and if so, how do you think about hedging now in that environment? Yes, I, I think it's Saudi and OPEC's intent to keep the price uh, higher the front month and stay in backwardation. So I'm a firm believer it's a great policy, uh, drive down inventories, keep the front month higher. So I anticipate the same going forward. Uh, we're going to be very opportunistic about hedging uh, in the future. So and one of the reasons we're only spending 50 percent of our cash flow on drilling now. Uh, a typical independent like Pioneer used to spend 100 percent. Now we're only spending 50%. Mm -hmm. And so there's not as much reason to hedge in the future. What's interesting, though, is that many CEOs are talking just like you, and you were kind of in the forefront of let's conserve our production because we want that higher oil price, right? But um, private producers may not be following your roadmap. So I'm wondering, doesn't that put you at some of a, a disadvantage? Like they're not going to follow the rules, uh, but you can't take advantage of that. <clears throat> well, uh, uh, companies have um, several choices what to do with their free cash flow. Most of them have too much debt. They're going to have to repair the balance sheet. That's number one. Some companies are going to have to build up their inventory because their inventory is only five years or less. And so Pioneer, uh, Devin announced a variable dividend. Pioneer is the second company to announce that policy. And so we are going to probably distribute more cash flow back to the investor than any other company because we have a great balance sheet. We don't have to build up our inventory. We have the greatest inventory in the U.S. So each company will be different, Alex, in that regard. Some will buy back stock. Uh, so a couple of the larger independents, same size or a little bit bigger, are said they're going to buy back stock. But I sort of question buying back stock at the top of the market. Our industry has done a very, very poor job of buying back stock. Uh, Scott, good morning. It's Guy. Sorry, just to pick up on that last point, top of the market. Just, just, can you give me a sense of the timing here? Uh, when I say top of the market, we're not, we're not at the top. But as you know, energy stocks are the best performers in the S&P 500 this year already. They've already rallied. There's probably some more room to go because most investors are not pricing these stocks on $65 Brent or $60 WTI. So there's probably some more room for these stocks to run. And the question is, are we going to move away from the old trading multiples of trading these stocks as on EBITDA and start trading off a free cash flow yield as we develop this track record? I still think um, oil is going to be in that $55 to $70 range um, over the next several years, $55 to $70 for Brent. So take about $3 off for WTI. But your sense is the bulk in, uh, of gains in energy stocks have been made at this point? I still think there's probably another 20 to 30 percent to run. But uh, the, the, the run from the lows of last year, most of it has occurred. So you probably got another 20 to 30 percent to run, in my opinion. Hey, Scott, there's been lots of conversation about super cycle time. You lived through a lot of super cycles. Does this feel like a super cycle? Um, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really tough to tell. I, I, I've been on record stating last year was probably the worst downturn. I'm surprised how fast it's come back. Uh, OPEC needs to manage it. Uh, if we see oil too much above 70, we know what happens. Uh, more people are going to invest in alternative energy. Secondly, it's going to hurt demand. Hmm. So we got to have a, a lid to where prices are going. And that's why I'm hoping we keep it in that $55 to $70 uh, investment. Now, the unknown factor, uh, we're all investing about 30% less. The entire world is investing about 30% less. So uh, 
is the what, what's going to happen to the supply over the next five years. And that's something that's very unknown. It's still disputed among our industry. Are we going to lead into a super cycle? But as we know, a super cycle leads to alternative energy investments, even more so, and it leads to reduced demand. Scott, I hope you've warmed up because it looked pretty chilly a few days back where you were. Um, has, has what you experienced changed the way that you're going to invest in your company? I clearly having access to electricity became a major problem. Getting access to all kinds of things became a major problem. Is that going to change the way that you think about the way you run the business in terms of the redundancy that you need? No, we've evaluated. Uh, the first issue was the safety of our families. We had over 300 families out of about 2,000 that had no power or water. Uh, we did everything we can to get them housing. We opened our office, office buildings in Midland and Dallas for them. We distributed over 600 cases. But in regard to winterizing, uh, our Permian Basin production will probably make very few investments. It was a 100-year storm. Uh, hopefully it doesn't happen again for another 100 years. So it was more the length of the storm. We've had a lot of polar vortexes, 2011, 1983, and we survived those. This happened to be five, six days. And so hopefully the next polar vortex next year will only be a two-day storm. Uh, hope is good, um, but there seems to be it's gonna, it feels like it's going to be very difficult for the grid to escape some kind of oversight uh, or a little regulation in some capacity. And I wonder if you are expecting something coming down from the state or the federal government in terms of more transparency, more resiliency. No, I, I think Governor Abbott and ERCOT are going to have to make some changes. We got to have reliability and we can't afford to pass on um, some of the bills that are coming to consumers. Consumers, as I've read, as y'all have read, are going to be paying very, very large utility bills. Uh, so they're paying huge utility bills over the next month. Uh, at the same time, they receive no power. So something has to change in that regard.